I want to talk to you a little bit about surveillance, um, filtering, uh, freedom of speech and what we can do to kind of protect our rights in a, an all new digital world. Really. Um, what I'm going to do is try and touch on a couple of these different subjects and get a bit of a discussion going towards the end because I think there's, there's an awful lot of scope here. We could really go into a lot of detail but I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of what's going on and a few of the things that the Open Rights Group are doing to try and protect people's rights and then we can have a bit of a Q&A and discussion afterwards. So, surveillance. We all know who this guy is. He's now one of the most famous whistleblowers of all time. Um, interestingly, he hasn't actually released the largest number of documents of all time, uh, which was Chelsea Manning. Um, but, of course, this is Edward Snowden. 2013 was sort of the year of revelations, really. Um, he's releasing about two million documents from various different go uh, governments um, around the world, um, from the UK, USA, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And uh, he was essentially an, a contractor who worked for a company um, who worked for the NSA, and, of course, he was a little bit dismayed with all of the information that he saw, decided it wasn't quite right and is now releasing this information. So the key thing here is that everything you're hearing from this isn't conspiracy anymore. The people that are standing up and talking to you about the things that the government know about you and the things that are being shared and the data that's being collected is no longer just science fiction, this is stuff that is actually happening. So it's really important to bear in mind. We also know who this guy is. This is Obama. This is actually taken from this week. He was um, giving an address about the surveillance programs um, in place at the moment, and he's deciding that he wants to try and change things a little bit. So um, here he's announcing reforms <coughs> on mobile surveillance. The interesting thing is he's not quite going all the way. What he's actually saying is he's going to have a look, and it's still really important that we protect ourselves from terror, which means you know, you're going to have to give up a few rights. What, what he's trying to say essentially is that we need a balance between safety and your freedom of, of speech and your freedom of privacy. But one interesting quote here, which I quite liked from his, uh, from his speech, was individual freedom is the wellspring of human progress. Which is a fascinating quote coming from a man who has actually introduced one of the, the most far-reaching uh, surveillance programs in history. I don't know, it swings and roundabouts. But Let's have a think about what's collected. So, mobile was the first thing that was talked about. On a mobile, the things that are collected are metadata. Now, metadata is things like, if you send a text, for example, it's the, you know, who, who it was sent to, it's perhaps the time, the date, uh, where you were when you sent it, it's that kind of thing. It's not strictly true, though, because actually we found out that they, they do have access to the content of your text messages as well, so they can read those calls as well. So they, again, they've told us it's metadata, which is you know, where you were when you called somebody, and where they were, who it was, what time, what date. But again, we actually know now that they can have full access to any call you make. And they can do this all remotely, they don't need to install anything on your phone, it's just something they can access. We'll talk about how they do it in a minute. And then computers, this is a little bit more scary. So there's a lot that they've got access to on your computer. Um, it turns out they can access all of your chat sessions, so things like if you're Skyping someone or um, you know, Yahoo Messenger. Um, they can access any emails that you send, not just the metadata or all the content, they can access the files that you send by email. They can access all of your social networks and all of the data from social networks. And there was a fascinating post made last year which was somebody requesting the data on them from Facebook. And the amount of data that Facebook stores in you is terrifying. You know, every single post, they've got every comment that was ever made, even if it was deleted. You know, there's a huge amount of data that's been collected there. Searches, anything you search for on Google. Location data, so where you were when you were doing things, and where your computer was. Um, webcam snippets as well, which is really interesting. They can, you know, if, you, if you're chatting with people on Skype, they can tap into your webcam, and you know, they're automatically getting fed all these pictures. Apparently about 3 to 11% of those pictures is nudity, which is nice to know. They're all seeing our naked Skypes. Just, I don't know how useful that is to catching terror, terrorism, really, but there you go. 
there was a really interesting quote by one of the guys, and this was actually in the NSA presentations. These presentations that were leaked were essentially internal memos of people saying, look at how good we are at spying on everyone. And one of the quotes, I'm going to read it, this is fascinating, he said, who knew in 1984 that this man would be Big Brother and the zombies would be their paying customers? Which is fascinating. We've actually walked into this ourselves by buying the technology with which they can use to survey. So how do they do it? Incredibly, undersea cables is one of the major factors here. So they actually tap into, um, I think it's every cable around the UK. There are some big, big fiber cables that come in. Um, this one is the, uh, I think it's called the SEA ME um, WE, which stands for Southeast Asia, Eastern you know, Europe and whatnot. What and essentially it's, it's 24,000 miles of, of cable that stretches across the world. Um, it's probably mapped on OpenStreetMap, I imagine. Um, it sends data at about 960 gigabits per second. And this cable's been tapped. So actually all that data that comes through gets collected and it gets processed. But not only that, it actually gets stored. So all this stuff is being stored in a huge repository somewhere for them to access at any time. And this actually carries not just internet stuff, but this is telecoms. This is your phone calls, your text messages, obviously all the internet stuff, transactions, um, banking transactions. So anything that's secure uses these as well. So it's a lot of data servers, they've actually got access to the back ends of big corporations and companies. So we already know that Facebook, for example, and Google and Microsoft have given access because they have to. They've been told they have to. There's court orders there. They've been told they're not allowed to tell anyone, but that's the way it goes. They've, they have this back door into various different servers. They use cookies as well, which is not those kind of cookies. So that would be lovely, but no. they, um, they even use the... Uh, the tracking cookies on advertising that Google uses. So it's, it's called them um, pref cookies. They actually use those to track and pinpoint people. Online games, incredibly. I didn't realize that terrorists use World of Warcraft to communicate, but apparently they do. Um, they are actually tracking text chat and voice chat through World of Warcraft, EVE Online, any sort of massively multiplayer online game. They're also tracking those. Another one is viruses. Now this one's really really scary. They actually produce viruses through an automatic system. This is something that actually takes control away from any sort of surveillance expert <coughs> or anything like that. So there's an automatic system, it's called Turbine. And Turbine, what it does is it basically will attack a certain person or a certain network of computers and it will try and decide what sort of exploit it needs to hack into the network. And once it's in, it then puts lots of viruses in there and tries to work out how it can extract your data. From there it can get any sort of files off your hard drive, it can get uh, files off any drives that are connected, it can infect itself on other computers. Really scarily, it can turn on your webcam without you knowing and it can start recording you and your microphone as well. And this is all, it just happens, it's just, you wouldn't even know it was occurring. And this is an automatic process, this is something that isn't even initiated by a surveillance expert. The system decides itself that you need to be looked at and so it just starts recording. So why does this really matter? Well, the first thing is we're trusting other people with this data. This data is actually everything about your lives. Everything is digital now. Everything we do happens digitally somehow. You know, we communicate, we transact, everything. So all this data is going into a repository somewhere that we know nothing about. The laws, obviously, we know nothing about. These are secret laws that have been brought in to allow this to happen. And we had no idea about it. But what else is there? What else is actually going on that we're not quite sure about? And can we really trust this pe these people with our information? And we already know that David Cameron can't leave a pub without leaving his daughter behind. So what's the chances that they're going to be keeping our data safe? And the other thing is that the vast majority of access to this data is warrantless. So any sort of surveillance operative in America doesn't need to ask a judge if they can look you up. They can just access the data any time they like. And they should be, they absolutely should be using the sort of judicial process to make sure this happens. But there was an audit in, in I think it was 2012 by the NSA that ruled that there were 2,776 violations 
of that law, which meant that they were just accessing whoever's data they wanted, really, whenever they wanted. This is the kind of thing that, you know, there has to be a process to make sure that this can't happen, that actually our data is safe and that people can't just access it whenever they want. But most importantly, privacy is your right. This is something that is in the European Convention of Human Rights. Your, your right to privacy is something that you are absolutely entitled to. And you don't have to give it up just because somebody tells you you have to. Unless, of course, you're doing something wrong and you, you know, you're committing crimes or you're, you know, somebody thinks you are. Somebody said to me the other day when I was preparing this presentation, they said, OK, what have you got to hide? Because obviously you're really worried about this. <laughs> what are you doing? What, what are you doing that you, know, you don't want other people to know? And I said to him, well, I don't want to tell you. And that's my right. <laughs> that's my right. If I want, if, well, okay, let's put it this way. P putting peanut butter up your ass is not a good idea, right? But it isn't illegal. There's nothing illegal about that. Just because it's not illegal does not mean I want you lot to know about it. <laughs> if you are going to put peanut butter up your ass, don't use sun pat. <laughs> the jars are a funny shape. Um, but it, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it is a joke, but I'm, I'm not religious. Obviously, I need to know. <laughs> I'm not religious, so I'm an atheist. But so why do I care that there are rights that allow other people to be religious? I'm not gay, I'm not homosexual. But why do I care that other people are allowed to be homosexual in this society? In a democratic society, this is the kind of thing that's important. It's the freedom for people to express themselves and be who they are. And that's the thing that we're starting to lose here. So that's why it's important. And that's why, even if you're doing nothing wrong, it's still the most fundamental and important thing in the world is your privacy. OK, so let's move on to filtering and just touch on this one. So filtering at the moment, this is a, a bit of a hot topic. Um, there are ISP level filtering that is happening now is, is default, but on the, I think it's the top four providers we'll come to in a minute. Um, this is also another important point, which I'll also sort of explain. Um, essentially, it means that you're blocking websites that you don't want people to access. At the moment, um, this is something you can turn on and off. But for the more, four main providers, it's on by default. And you have to call them, or you have to, when you're applying, you have to basically say, actually, I want to look at these things. The kind of things that are blocked are essentially things that are unsuitable for minors. Who decides that? Of course, this is another contentious point. But it's things like, you know, sites about, obviously, sex and nudity, um, violence, drugs, alcohol, abuse. But also, there's a, there's a couple of things like, um, uh, you know, games and things. But there's also um, political sites, perhaps things that are a little bit controversial. They're also blocked by default. And on your mobile, what's really interesting is most people don't know. Mobiles have been blocked by default since 2004. This is something that actually has been going on for quite some time and uh, you'll notice especially if you're on Vodafone and especially if you're on a business phone um, the vast majority of sites that you're trying to look at are actually blocked so you have to ring them up and you have to get it unblocked straight away. Um, public Wi-Fi, schools, um, institutions like libraries, you know any sort of public Wi-Fi, they're generally blocked by default. These are the four main ones that are doing it already. So there's a, um, a sort of uh, an unofficial pact, if you like, a sort of um, uh, voluntary code of practice between these four, who they've basically said, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to implement it, because there isn't really a framework for it yet. Um, just out of interest, does anybody, if you pop your hands up, if you're actually on a broadband network with one of these four? Okay, and leave your hands up if you have left your filters on. Or you don't know. <laughs> Okay, right, well that's, yeah, that's interesting. But why is this a bad thing? Because obviously filtering is good, right? We don't want kids to see this stuff. Well, one, it doesn't just block porn. So the first thing is, there are lots of other things it, it blocks. So there's, you know, alcohol, drugs, um, controversial politics. And this is the kind of thing where actually, it, it's a bit different depending on who you're actually with, what provider you're with, you know, what, what the actual privacy frameworks are. The second thing is it doesn't work. The number of times we've seen sites that have been blocked when they shouldn't have been, and sites that haven't been blocked when they absolutely should have been. Um, 
it's also really difficult if you are blocked to actually get yourself unblocked. Again, there's no central place where you can just say, okay, my, my site is actually about cats and, and not something else, you know. Um, how do I unblock this? Why, why are you blocking me? It also stops people from accessing sites that are really useful to them. If somebody's in, in an abusive relationship, let's say, they might not want to access a site about that from their home. So they might go somewhere else, like a library. But then if the site is blocked, what do they do? This is the kind of thing where this information is really valid and useful, and it's being blocked by accident because of a law that's been put in place. The third thing, is, again, is really important, is it doesn't teach safety. One of the really important things that we should be doing is teaching our children how to behave and how to treat other people and everything else, but also how to behave online. And there's a, this is a video from 1975. This is Green Cross Code Man. I don't remember this. I'm far too young. No. Um, <laughs> Green Cross Code Man taught kids how to cross the road. <coughs> At this point, we could have said, you know what, the roads are way too dangerous. And yes, we're going to teach you how to cross the road, but actually, if you cross it here and not that Pennington crossing down the road, we're going to arrest you. And we're going to take you to jail, and we're going to make you pay a fine. But we didn't do that. What we did was, we taught people how to cross the road. Casualties dropped, and the roads became safer. It's as simple as that. Teaching people is far more effective than removing something. Because, you know, these kids are going to see this stuff anyway. It's going to happen. There's going to be a time when they accidentally get to a site that you thought was blocked. But if you've not given them the information on how to deal with that kind of thing, what are they going to do? They're going to fall apart. And then the fourth one, of course, is censorship. These sites are legal. There's nothing wrong with these sites. The ones they're blocking, there's nothing illegal, there's nothing illegal about them. So actually it's censorship. And if we were to bring this in by default on all the ISPs, we'd be the only democratic society in the world to do so. There are no others. Which, again, do we really want to put ourselves in that position? Yeah. There was a, a study in uh, 2012 by TalkTalk Talk when they asked um, their users, how many of them wanted, by default, parental control settings, and 78% said no. And yet, they've now brought it in anyway. Let's move on to the last one, which is freedom of speech. Um, there's a couple of different bits here, so I'll, I'll kind of touch on this a bit quickly. Um, there is a law at the moment that means that videos like this are illegal. This is obviously Downfall, a uh, film Downfall from about nine years ago. And I mean, we've all seen them, right? We've seen the, this, these videos where, you know, it's, it's somebody who, I don't know football, <coughs> but maybe someone didn't put, kick the ball right into the goal and then, you know, Hitler gets angry about it. Um, or somebody removed a video from YouTube and Hitler gets angry about it. <coughs> this is called a parody. It's because they've taken the copyrighted work and they've improved it, they've changed it a little bit, and it's a parody, it's for you. This is currently illegal in this country. You're not allowed to do it. This law is outdated and just doesn't seem to make sense. <coughs> when everyone does it anyway, and actually it's not harming you, it's an, it's an improvement. Why is this still the case? Sorry. This is actually meant to be reformed next month. And again, I think they're probably going to miss the deadline here. But this is the kind of thing that we're looking at when it comes to freedom of speech. It's really important that we're able to express ourselves how we want to. And at the moment, the laws and the frameworks haven't caught up with how we're working digitally. Um, but parody itself is really important because it's, it's a tool not just for humour, but it's also for getting points across. It's for, you know, it's for raising awareness. And if we lose that, then it's quite a big loss, really. Other things are, um, how many people still have CDs and buy CDs? Are there many of you? How many of you have taken, because we've all done it, the tracks from your CDs and put them on your iPod? Yeah, that's illegal. You're not allowed to do it. And again, it's not just in this country, but sharing that file between your CD and something else is technically illegal. And that doesn't make sense, because we've moved on. Our technology has moved on. You might still buy CDs, because that's actually, you know, in, in the way we, we consume our media, that's the way we do it. But we don't do it that way. If you've got it in your car, it's easy to have it on your iPod. You're walking down the road, you don't want a Walkman spinning in your pocket. The laws need to catch up. And so this is where you know, uh, organisations like the Open Rights Group exist because we're trying to sort of push governments and, 
and legislation in the right direction. So, how do we protect our rights? Well, the Open Rights Group has got a number of different campaigns um, on the go at the same time. We're, we're looking at these things at the moment anyway. Um, surveillance, there's a big campaign which you might have seen, um, I think it was uh, beginning of this month called Don't Spy Us, which was about surveillance. Um, if you haven't signed up, you should. Um, essentially, there are six um, key strategic points that they want to try and push forward, which are um, that they want no surveillance without suspicion. You shouldn't be collecting all your data unless you've been, you know, somebody thinks you've been committing a crime. Um, the laws should be transparent. We should know about them. We should know how they work, and we should know how the the organisations that are collecting this data work. It should be judicial, not political. Uh, authorization. You should have to ask a judge before you start invading someone's privacy. There should be effective democratic democratic oversight. At the moment, their actually their oversight is themselves. I mean, if the NSA are saying we're fine, we're doing fine, we did an audit last year, we're totally cool. Yeah, it's not really good enough. We need somebody else to be looking over you and making sure that you're doing the right thing. Really, there should be the right to redress, and there should be a secure web for all. One of the things the NSA are trying to do at the moment is crack secure encryption. So, you know, your credit card payments and things, they want to crack them and just see what's going on. It's not right. If they do that, the whole security of the web becomes more difficult. And it puts everyone in jeopardy. So it's really important. Filtering um, is another thing that obviously the Open Rights Group are trying to shape and campaign against, um, especially by default. Again, it's something that we should be providing people with a choice. It's not providing it by default. But it is something that, yes, people might want, but it's more about educating people and making sure they know how things work. And being safe online, that is the real education, that's what we need to be giving people. Um, there was another one as well, which was the medical program, which you might have heard of. I don't know if anybody heard about this at all, but it was called Care Data. And it was a, a program to share your medical information with um, a big computer network. Um, including private companies, and the idea was that they were going to try and make your care more effective. The problem was, they didn't tell you who they were going to share the data with, they didn't tell you what data was going to go, <laughs> there was an awful lot of stuff that nobody really knew. And luckily, groups like the Open Rights Group managed to stop it at the time and say, okay, you need to hold up and just let people know what's going on. So luckily that's something that's been postponed. So this is the kind of thing that we're looking into. The other thing I haven't mentioned today as well is local issues. Um, because again, the Open Rights Group in Norwich is, is very new, at the moment it's just me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, there might be quite a few local issues in terms of privacy, in terms of how data gets moved around, and we need to start talking about that. We need to start getting people involved and making sure that these issues start coming to light and we can start impacting them. We need to be talking to local politicians, we need to be talking to candidates and making sure that they know what we want and that they're actually representing our views on digital rights in Palm. Um, I think I'll close up by just saying this kind of stuff is, is very important, and if you do care about it, then it's something that we can affect. Um, and especially, I mean, if we give up our rights and liberties and our freedoms, then what's the point in protecting us from terrorism? Because we've lost already. That's it from me. Um, Let's have a little chat and see what we can do. <laughs>